Good morning, Hopewell Church. Let's stand and worship the Lord together this morning. Greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away. Good job, ladies. Welcome, Hopeful Church. You can have a seat for announcements. It is good to be with you today, and I'm glad you made it safely. If you didn't make it safely, you're not here. I don't know about it anyways, um, but we'll, we'll be praying for you. Uh, sorry, it's one of those days. I bought hit a couple of deer on the way it was, this morning. It was great. Um, no, but thank you for being here. It is good to be with you today at church, especially considering the particular excitement it is. I know we have extra guests here this morning, so Friends and family members of those of uh, the families who are dedicating kids today, God bless you for going above and beyond to support your family. Today is Child Dedication Sunday. It's, uh, I'm excited about it. The first time we've done it here at Hopewell during my tenure. And it is going to be um, it's a good reminder of what our mission and purpose is. We'll get to that more later on. And we're doing it today in part because it's Sanctity of Life Sunday. Again, we'll unpack that more later on. 
couple announcements for you. First, Patsy just asked, you know, we are collecting things for uh, the Cal Pregnancy Center. If you're not aware, there are a couple pregnancy centers in Auburn. Um, there is one sponsored by a local hospital. Um, it is, there's a significantly more money, therefore, flowing into that one. We really appreciate our partnership with the DeKalb Pregnancy Center because one of their distinctions is that they are not going to, um, they're going to, not be shy about bringing up the gospel, right? They're not going to shove it down throats, but they're not going to be shy about bringing up the gospel and saying, hey, have you considered what God's role is and what God says in this and turning to a life in him? The other, uh, one of the other pregnancy centers in DeKalb says, yeah, we'll talk about it if a lady brings it up. And, and as those who work in the community have said, uh, I've been doing this for 15 years and no woman ever brings it up on their own, right? So I, we are just grateful to support that ministry in particular because of their Christ-centeredness. And again, we do this to show the love of Christ, right? We, the ultimate hope for any child is the gospel. And so we are grateful for that partnership. So if you want to help support the Pregnancy Center in very tangible and needed ways, there is the... Um, Pack and play out there. Uh, I think it's what it's called, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to dig back in those memories. Um, and, and we'd like to fill it up with stuff. They are going to do that for another day, another week at least. Right, Patsy? At least maybe one more week? Two more weeks? Two more weeks. So you have opportunities there. Also, women's Bible study is gearing up again. Another sets of sign-ups. You can see Carrie. Carrie, yeah, there's a little hand waving up. Thank you. You can see her for more details. You could turn them in as uh, happen. Hey, uh, Mondor ladies, would you mind doing a Vanna White back there at the table? There is a, oh yeah, we have a Vanna White and then a model. Yes, there you go. There's the sign-up table back there for the Euchre tournament. I just want to let you know, um, I'm not very competitive at all, but me and my mom have either won or tied for the win of every Euchre tournament so far. So you're welcome to come and try us. Jason, bring your A game next time, please. I'm a little disappointed in your skills. The last one was embarrassing. <laughs> all right. And the last, the last thing I want to remind you, and this one, this one is important uh, to pay attention to because of the timing. We only have, like, I think, one week to strike at it. Women's Ministry has scheduled a tour of the Brands Chocolate Factory. Um, they said I could come along, so I'm crashing that one. I'm not. Um, that's, that's Monday, January 30th at 5.30 p.m. They're going to meet at Auburn Road location at 5.15 for the tour. It's $10 cost, but you get a coupon to use to get your money back. So they're pretty smart. And then um, after the tours, the ladies will pick a place to go for dinner if anyone's interested. But I think you need to sign up today, correct? So I think there's another sign up back there. So this is your one and only chance to get yourself some DeBrand chocolate on the cheap and spend some time with them ladies, which how, how much better can it get? Right? Right. All right. Uh, I think that's all I need to say. Cool. All right. Let's, uh, let's pray. Who, who's praying? Are you praying? No? No? Okay, I'll pray today. I'm looking at an elder front row deer in his life. It's one of those Sundays, brothers and sisters. All right, let's pray. Father, we want to come before you and say thank you. You are a good and gracious God. It is a joy to belong to you. Look, we know there are plenty of things going on in the world that could give us cause for concern or that is outright evil or um, think, you know, there's just a lot of that. But Lord, we want to say thank you that we are in you. We have your life. We have your joy. We have your peace that transcends all understanding, which guards our hearts and minds. We have the body of Christ and the ability to meet together as a community of faith, as the church, and to celebrate you, to remember you, and to be strengthened in our walk with you. And on a day like today, to look forward to the future, to say, man, we are so grateful how you gave us life, both physically and eternal life. And Lord, we look forward to passing that message of salvation on to the next generation. And we want to stand up for them and protect the lives of the vulnerable in our community, in our society. And we just want to say thank you for that call. Say thank you for how you have been doing that and been working that out through the church over thousands of years. And we want to dedicate ourselves today to be a part of that. So God, we want to say thank you. And ask that you would work in our lives in this time. Lord, if there's a sin that you might need to convict us of, if there's an area of, of unsurrender in our lives, may you bring that to the surface today so that we can surrender that to you. And most importantly, may we end today committed together as a community to invest our lives into the next generation of Christians, the young people that, you, that are among us today and in our family. We just say thank you for them and, and ask you to help us to be faithful in that mission. Be with us as we continue worshiping. Be with the ladies. May they, may they do an awesome job. Amen. 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 I prayed for you. You had to, got to rise to the... We're going to try. We're going to try. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, let's stand and continue in worship. At this time, we're also going to pass the offering baskets around. Um, so just as that's happening, just remember offering is just another way that we give back to God and we return what's always been his, our will, our steps in life, and um, our finances. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold.
to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. And trade them with joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born. Precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. help us to remember that and to keep moving toward you. Please bless the service today, bless the message, bless the dedication, bless the congregation. 
but um, more than anything, be blessed today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, while you're all standing, you might as well say hi to one another. So <laughs> turn to your neighbor and say good morning. Well, again, good morning. Uh, today is a wonderful day for us as we celebrate the Sanctity of Life Sunday by doing parent-child dedications. Now, before we get into the most exciting part of our time together, bear with me for a bit as I remind us of God's heart and desire for the church or why we as a church would do such a thing as parent-child dedications in our gathering as, as our gatherings. So to start with, let me say an obvious thing that, that God values human life. And to hearken back to our Genesis series, which I'm very excited to get back into next week. Genesis 127, right? A verse we've come back to time and time again. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And I know this, quote, basic truth of our faith is found on the very first page of Scripture. But as we've seen in our study of Genesis, these basic truths are often the neglected ones. That we're made in his image. That we are made unique out of all of creation to bear God's image. Like a child who looks like their mother or father. So we as God's children are made in our father's image. And that has nothing to do with our physical nature. But our humanity. With our, as we talked about in Genesis, mental, moral, and relational capacity. That sets us apart from all of rest of God's creation. And our value is not just seen here in Genesis 1 at our moment of creation, but also in the lengths that God went to in order to redeem us, to get us back from our rebellion and estrangement. The family was divided. The kids were wayward. And so he didn't just value us when he created us, but he valued us even in our, our rebellion. He valued our lives enough to send his son to die so that we can be forgiven and be reconciled with God our Father and have everlasting life. Another classic verse for John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And remember, the key to this verse is the word, word world. The world being talked about is the people, first and foremost. While God will restore the earth when he comes again, making all things new and all things right, Jesus came to redeem us because we are the pride and joy of God's creation. And our responsibility as God's people, those that know God, know his will and his priorities, is that we should be like him. Our mission as Christians is to carry out God's will and his word into the world, to represent him, to do his work, not sit back and just watch everything go, but to take up the mission and empowering of the Holy Spirit and advance the kingdom. And what is that work he's called us to? Caring for the people that he cares about, which is everybody. And while many people get cared for naturally in life. It's easy to care for certain people than others. There are people in groups that tend to fall through the cracks. 
Again, because God loves everybody, he doesn't want any to be neglected. Which is why in the Bible he told the church to care for those neglected in their society. James 1.27, right? The religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows and their distress and to keep oneself from being stained by the world. God in, called Israel to care for those in their society that would fall through the cracks more often. The most vulnerable. Those most at risk of being neglected and abused. And orphans and widows will always be on that list, but they are not the only ones. Again, this verse gives us a principle to care for those neglected. And there is a lot of talk today in our society. There's a lot of debate going on in our culture about who truly are the vulnerable. And there are certainly lots of vulnerable people. People vulnerable to the power and authority wielded by certain other peoples and groups. In our critical, and in our critical theory mood, our way of thinking is actually deepening these divides. And thus making more people vulnerable. Because it's class against class. It's gender against gender. It's race against race. It's social economic stance against others. But I think one group who is the most vulnerable and often one most easily neglected in our society is this. And it's because they are not as useful as consumers or voters. And that group is kids. Right? We live in a society that values you because you vote for them or they can get something from you. And you don't really get that from kids. There is almost nobody else in society that has less agency, less power, and less voice. Let me explain those. Kids have less agency. They have the least amount of ability to make choice over their own lives. They're dependent upon somebody else making choices for them. Kids have less power. They have the littlest amount of ability to change the world. They don't get to vote. They don't get to post on social media, or they probably shouldn't be. They don't get to change the world. And kids have less voice to speak on behalf of themselves to those in power. The only group that would rival this, what I would say would be the mentally disabled. Right? Those who value children in terms of vulnerability. And so on Sanctity of Life Sunday, we remember the value of human life, of all human life, and the life of some of the most vulnerable in our society, that is children. And when I say children, let me define, I mean from the moment of conception of their mother's womb until adulthood. Children. This valuing of human life, this caring for children, is not a new idea. It isn't something that, is, that uh, becomes a political move by the church in the last 50 years as we just discovered that we valued human life. No, it is, re, you know, there's been an increased effort in this in the last 50 or so years in America because of cultural context. But we didn't just invent the doctrine of protecting human life. It's part of our theology in history, in origin. In the Gospel of Luke, we get this interesting account of Jesus' followers being, well, in our terms, rude, to be frank. Let me, let me read it to you. Jesus was teaching to a crowd of people, and here Luke tells us, Luke 18, 15, now they, now they, people in the crowd, were bringing infants to him, Jesus, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it happening, people bringing infants to Jesus, they rebuked them. Can you imagine that? Get your kids out of here. But Jesus called to them saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Look at that. I truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. I mean, if you, if you really just kind of dig into the cultural context here, you dig into the, the, their society's dying of children, you really think about what Jesus is saying. He's saying the kingdom belongs to those in your society that you value less, right? Kids were not as valued or respected in some ways as our society in the, as in theirs. He said, no, let them come to me. I, the Savior of all mankind, God in flesh, here to do the most important work of ministry, am not going to be isolated from infants and children. They are welcome to come. The kingdom of God belongs. And in fact, if you want to inherit the kingdom, you need to be more like a child. So start playing more video games, I guess. Yay! <laughs> That's going to come back to bite me later. All right. What is it about a child's faith that should be respected? An openness to believe, where we can be overly skeptical. A meekness to know that they are small, and that there are things much bigger than themselves, where we 
think that we're big. The humility to accept that there are those who know better and have a higher authority. Where for most of us, we think there is no higher authority other than myself. Ideally, these are the traits that characterize a child and traits that we should seek to emulate as Christ followers. Jesus cares for children, even so far as starting the adoption movement. Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us for adoption as his sons. The adoption is a part of our theology. <clears throat> we as Christians are the ones who realize that we ourselves are adopted. We are inher inherited by God, brought in by God, chosen by God to be a part of his family and as his sons. And the word sons there is important, right? If women among our midst, do not think that this doesn't speak to you. This is an elevation of your standing in Christ because sons in the ancient world were the only ones who inherited Right? They're the ones who carried the name. They're the ones who inherited the property. They're the ones who received the blessing. And when God calls all of us his sons, he's saying, you all are equal standing in me. You all receive inheritance. You all are valued. So we're not just children, but privileged and blessed sons. Every Christian male and female is blessed son who inherits the kingdom of God. This valuing of human life, this recognition of our own adoption drove us in the earliest stages of the church to begin caring for the most vulnerable in our society. From preaching against abortion, the Didache, written 85 to 110, it's the earliest non-scripture writing that we have. It's a manual of worship and instruction for the church to say this is how you live your life. I mean, written when the apostles were still could possibly alive, or at least the ones that sat underneath the disciples' feet could help instruct this. And they said this, you shall not murder a child by aborting them or kill them when they're born. The church, from the very earliest generation, recognized the value of human life. Barnabas, writing at 130, said this, you shall not abort a child nor again commit infanticide. So while we don't see abortion addressed directly in Scripture, the earliest church repeatedly speaks to it as they apply the clear teachings of Scripture into life. It goes on, right? Not just abortion, but they, they started adopting kids abandoned on the streets of Rome. It was not uncommon. It was that if you did not want your child or they were deformed or you wanted a boy and you got a girl, you just drop them into the streets of Rome. Let them sit in the gutter and in the filth, the human filth that would be washed down. You just chuck your baby in there. They said you could walk the streets of Rome and hear the baby's crying for a mother. Callistus 223 provided refuge to abandoned children by placing them in Christian homes. Within a couple hundred years, the church was adopting. One of the reasons why the church grew so much, it went from the smallest uh, religious group in the Roman society to the largest in 300 years. One of the reasons why they did that is because they adopted. They adopted those little girls on the side of the road, raised them as Christ's followers, and then, you know, uh, when a guy wanted to marry a quality girl, he got converted. <laughs> you know, they grew the church. I wouldn't recommend missionary dating. I'm just saying it happens sometimes. From adopting abandoned kids to the mass spreading of orphanages, pregnancy centers, and preschools. The church has always been about this. The fourth century is when orphanages became commonplace because of the church. It was the church who started them because God teaches us to value all human life. Benegis of Dijon in the third century offered nourishment and protection to abandoned children, including some with disabilities caused by unsuccessful abortions. The third century, we have that care happening in the church. And so the reason why we have preschools today and orphanage today, and they are commonplace and an expected part of society is because the church said, this is what God says about the value of human life. Let's put it into practice. What is commonplace to us today would not be if it wasn't for the church being the church. One of the most notable figures in the, the uh, movement of orphanages is George Mueller. If you have not read about this dude, you need to. Uh, let me just side note for a second. One of the most edifying things and challenging things you can do for your Christian faith is go pick up some biographies about some great saints of the past and see how they lived a life of faithfulness and obedience being sold out to Christ. And again, there are millions of people that have lived incredible lives. We just only have the writings of a handful of them, right? Of these saints that we get to pass on. But go read about them and be challenged and get a different picture of what a life in, that sold out to Christ might look like. George Mueller lived 1805 to 1898. He cared for 10,024 orphans in his life. He established 117 Christian school, or schools offering Christian education to over 120,000 children, mostly poor. He did this without receiving a dime of government money. 
If you look at his life, you'll see a man who demonstrated great faith. Faith that God has called the church to this task. Faith that God would show up, show up and provide in big ways and small. <clears throat> Supposedly, there are plenty of times when George Mueller would have the kids pray in things, sitting around the table for a meal they didn't have yet and didn't have the money to buy. Let's sit at our empty table and, and praise God for a meal that we don't even have before us. One, one well-documented occasion, thanks was given for breakfast when all the children were sitting at a table, even though there was nothing to eat at the house. As they finished praying, the baker knocked on the door with sufficient bread to feed everyone. And the milkman gave them plenty of fresh milk because his cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. Talk about a life of faith and teaching young people about a life of faith. Church, God is ready to do a great work if we are willing to be a people of faith and obedience. And it's important for us as a church to remember our history, to look back and remember these things, because a lot of our work has been taken over by the government, non-Christian groups. And as the culture continues to walk away from the gospel, continues to demonstrate a devaluation of human life, we will see an increasing need for the church to step back into these areas. In fact, it might even, there's a, there's, it's messy, it's tough for the church to do it, right? It's so difficult. There's so much resources that it's needed. But I think, man, what have we lost when the government has taken over what belonged to the church to care for the orphans and widows? I praise God that so many are taken care of, but I also mourn deeply that the people taking care of the young people these days, so many of them don't even know Christ and can't, prevent, can't provide them with the ultimate hope. All that to say the value of adopting the abandoned, of taking in the needy, of protecting the most valuable, those are our values those come from our Lord, demonstrated by him in our lives and through our lives. Those are our things. We don't give them up to anybody else. And anybody else who wants to champion them is simply borrowing from our tradition and borrowing our theology, even if they don't recognize our Lord, even if they don't want to admit it. They're taking a play from our playbook. But again, they often miss the most essential part, the offering of salvation through Jesus Christ. And so church, we get to the last point I want to make today, which is an obvious one. That the valuing and caring for children has always been a church mission, not just a parent mission. Children have always stepped up, Christians have always stepped up and stepped into the life of children, be it their own biological children or not. Because God cares for us, and God cares for them, and God has adopted us, therefore we should adopt them. God Brings up, yeah, I won't go on. Because God adopted us into family. Because we want to show God's love and pass on the gospel and our eternal hope and salvation to the next generation. And so we are here today to continue this great work. And so let me say a couple thank yous. Thank you to all those who are working in Kids Hub. If you're working in Kids Hub right now, would you just, just humor me for a second and stand up? If you work in the kids ministry at the church, just stand up. Volunteer in it. Serve in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you actually like, tolerate, or bless and take care of somebody that is standing, thank you. Because there's two ways to help, right? There's working directly with the kids, and there's building up a strength in the people that are working with kids so that you can encourage them for the investment, so that you can say, keep going, sister. Keep going, brother. Keep loving the Lord. Let me carry your burden so that you can go and carry theirs. And secondly, I want to say thank you to those that are serving in youth group. So if you are serving in youth group, helping as a volunteer and a leader, would you stand up as well? There's Holly peeking out there. Thank you. Back in the tech booth there. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have heard many stories from my brothers and sisters here at this church about how you're faithful in the mission and in investing in children. And I just want to say praise the Lord. That is a good thing. It is a good thing for us to be about as a body. Today we're going to express our commitment to the next generation through the investing of our lives into the kids of our church family and into the lives of their parents. Church, we make the biggest impact on the future by being faithful with the children God entrusted to us as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles to raise a child in the way that they should go. And that verse that we rely upon in Proverbs is, again, it's a proverb. It's a general truth. It's, it's a short, pithy statement that's generally true. And so it's not a guarantee. By what we're going to do today, by investing our lives in the next generation, there's no guarantee that every single one of them will choose to follow Christ. But, I, but we can trust that God will use the seeds planted and the training to generally 
consistently lead them to Christ and to surrender. Or as we say at Hope, well, our mission is to love God, love people, and leave a legacy. And buddy, the kids in our midst are one of the biggest legacies we have. Amen? Amen. All right, enough of that. <clears throat> um, families, would you come up on stage that are, being, that are doing the dedication? So the Ingleburs, the Smiths, Joy and Rebecca, the Schwartzes. Oh, no, I shouldn't make any jokes about that either, should I? I'm just going to, you know, we'll pass the mic down and just, we'll have each family introduce themselves, who they are, and their, their children's names. Way to be dad, juggling everything. Uh, I'm Ryan, this is my wife Lizzie, Emmerich, and Gideon. I'm Joe McElroy, this is my wife Rebecca, and my grandson Alessandro. <laughs> I'm Logan, uh, this is my wife Chelsea. And we have Alex, Amelia, and Andrew. I'm Cody. Uh, this is my wife, Bethany. And these are our boys, Manny, Finley, and Gabriel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. One of the biggest responsibilities we take on in this life is that of a parent. Or a grandparent who's stepping in. As parents, you carry the biggest influence over your child. And you have the responsibility to use that influence to raise your child in the ways of the Lord. Smiths, Schwartz, McElroys, Ingleberths, you set an example and teach a life of godly living. It's not a Sunday thing. It's an everyday thing. Amen? Today, before the body of Christ and before God, you are dedicating yourselves to the task and responsibility of raising your children or grandchildren in the God-honoring ways, in the fear and love of the Lord. You are modeling what Jesus' parents did to Jesus in Luke 2.22 when they brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord. And by the way, as I told them this morning, let me just say, this is an important thing we're doing today. The commitment you're making today, you've already made. I've seen these families demonstrate a desire to raise these kids up in the ways to honor the Lord. And so I'm proud of you guys. You guys are already on the path. Today is an affirmation, as I told them. It's like the pillar of stones, right? When they cross the Jordan River, God says, build the pillar of stones so you look back and remember the commitment that was made, the faithfulness of God. These are memorial times and times really for us as a church to be reminded of our mission and our commitment. We'll get to that more in a minute. But I just want to say you guys are already doing this. You've already made the commitment and seeing you walk that out. So we ask parents to... Make this promise before God and before the, the body of Christ for a reason. And it isn't just to show off your cute kids. Emmerich, I'm just looking at you. Pretty, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we ask parents and grandparents to commit themselves to godly parenting before the church because we as a church have a responsibility to help these families. We're to walk with them through life, aiding and encouraging, challenging and supporting their efforts. We do not pursue God in isolation. We do not parent in isolation. So let the body of Christ be a part of your life. And body, church, hope will family, engage these families. Help them. I stand here as a pastor, as a representative of our commitment to you as a congregation and as the elders. So a parent-child dedication is a time for three commitments to be made. Parents, to raise your kids in God-honoring ways. Secondly, for us as a body to commit to walking with you and aiding you in the efforts as parents to invest into your kids. And thirdly, as elders, to shepherd you so that you might be better equipped to fulfill your mission and responsibility as they grow in the Lord. Let me tell you what it is. I've told you what it is. Let me tell you what this isn't. This isn't a guarantee to salvation. This ceremony is not somehow going to divine, be divinely special, unlocking new access to God. Today might be a turning point for your life and then the lives of your child or grandchild. But anytime we commit to being faithful to, and obedient to God's word and will, we are at turning points. Every act of obedience unlocks God's blessings and brings us closer to him. So once again, this is the time to make those three commitments. Let me read to you a scripture and then we'll ask you some questions. Deuteronomy 6.4. Classic, you guys remember it, I'm sure. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
and with all your soul and with all your strength. I love it. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. And check this, right? God wants all of who you are as parents. And then he says this, impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. That means phylacteries. Put some scripture on your head, Ryan. I'm, I'm asking you. Next Sunday, right? Scripture on your forehead? Okay, good. <laughs> Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates, right? Instruct them in all ways through all, all your life. So, let me ask you a couple questions. And they, they've known them, they're prepared. Are you ready to publicly make your commitments to follow the Lord? Have you as parents and grandparents placed your trust in Christ as Savior? And are you committed to following Him as your Lord? If so, answer yes. 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 Do you recognize that your child is a gift from God and that you are responsible to train and instruct this child in the things of God with the help and the support of the community of believers? If so, answer yes. Do you solemnly promise before God, the church, that by God's grace you will teach your children and your words and your actions, God's will, God's word, and God's ways? If so, answer yes. Yes. Elders at Hopeful Church. I know some of them couldn't be here today, but if you're an elder at Hopeful Church, please stand up. James, a couple of them on stage. Okay. Do you commit to shepherding these families as they are part of this, con as long as they're part of this congregation? To invest our lives and to exhort them in godly living and faithfulness. So, answer yes. Yes, yes, thank you. Body of Christ, Hopewell Church. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able. Church, do you commit to walking alongside and helping these parents as they seek to raise Emmerich, Gideon, Manly, Manny, Finley, Gabriel, Alessandre, Alex, Amelia, and Andrew in God's way? If so, answer, we do. We do. We do. You may be seated. You may be seated. Um, one, there's two uh, special things I want to do yet. First is to have the families kind of read the prayers that they have written over their kids. We did this. We say a similar prayer over our kids every night. And so these are your prayers. Can we hold the mic for you? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have blessed us with Emmerich and Gideon and that we get to be their parents. May you help us to raise them to be godly men and chase after you and your, and your truths. May they, above all else, rely on your steadfast love and trust in your forgiving grace. May they both continually grow in their knowledge and understanding of you to become bright lights that shine in a dark world. For Emmerich, Lord, we pray that he would continually walk towards you. May Emmerich's love of books lead him to a passion for your written word. With his reserve of passionate soul, may he learn to listen and decipher truth uh, his ever gr with his ever-growing questions. And for Gideon, Lord, may he, he continue to use his joy and ever-ready smile to brighten the lives of those around him. May his curiosity and everything point him back to your beautiful creation. We commit ourselves as their parents to guide and direct their spiritual growth to the best of our abilities. May we prepare them for the future ahead, for we know that you have a plan for each of them. We pray that someday soon, both Emmerich and Gideon will come to personally believe in Christ's sacrifice and resurrection as a gift to cherish and to cling through throughout their lives. Amen, amen. Amen. Lord God, the creator and sustainer of all things, great and awesome are the works of your hands. Thank you, Father, for the life of Alessandre. We have already seen your will being done in his short little life thus far. We pray that your will continues to be done for the rest of his life, that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide him. We pray that Alessandre will grow up to be a man after your own heart, that he will not only want and accept your free gift of salvation and redemption for himself, but that he will desire it for everyone that crosses his path in life here on earth, that he will continuously spread the good, great news to all of your, <laughs> great news to all for your glory and for the good of your people. May you bless him with wisdom as you did with Solomon, knowing right from wrong in a world that so often tries to stray us 
from your ways. May his eyes stay fixed upon you, Jesus, throughout his life's journey. And when they do stray from you, please, Lord, redirect him back to you. For you are the only way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for the blessing of Alex and Amelia and Andrew in our life. We thank you for each day that you give us as a family. We pray that our children have a life that is safe, healthy, and wise. We pray for wisdom in raising our children, for patience with each other, and that we will always love each other no matter what comes our way. We pray that we would grow into a family that comes to truly listen and rely on each other and on you. But most importantly, we pray that Alex, Amelia, and Andrew decide to follow you, that they live a life that's pleasing to you. We pray that they look to you and that they keep you at the center of their lives. We pray they grow spiritually and strive to become the child of God you made them to be. Help them know that they are not defined by their past mistakes and that they know you will always forgive them as long as they genuinely ask for forgiveness. Amen. God, we thank you for the gift of family and for the children you have entrusted to us. We know each of them are a true blessing from you, and we accept the responsibility of loving, parenting, and teaching them according to your word. Boys, our prayer for you is to grow in wisdom and confidence in who you are in the Lord so that you can live and love others well and in truth. May your ambition be to live by the Spirit and embody his attributes, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Manny, you are a treasure. You have a soft heart that recognizes the needs of others and what a blessing that is. We pray God will continue to grow that attribute in you, in you for his glory. May you come to trust the Lord in all areas of your life and stand firm in God's truth, not to be easily swayed. Finley, our mighty warrior, we pray you will become fierce in your knowledge and love uh, for the Lord and that you will root yourself in God's word. May you love others well and live for the glory of God alone. Gabriel, you love to bring life and laughter wherever you are. We pray that as you grow, you will love others deeply and with a humility that points to Christ. May your identity come to rest in Christ alone. As your parents, we pray God will equip us with the wisdom, patience, and gentleness to love and teach you in a way that draws you closer to God. We love you and thank God for you, the blessings that you are to our family. The last thing we're going to do um, is invite you to pray um, over them. And so how this will look practically, we're, we'll have you guys step down kind of closer into here. And then we're going to get first dibs. So if you're like family member, grandmas, grandpas, come on up first, gather around, lay hands. And the rest of us, the second tier people, uh, we can come up and, and gather around them. And then we'll just pray over them together, right? Uh, my ask with that is, wouldn't you pray, please use your outside voice, not your inside voice, right? Like, so, so that we can join with you in prayer. Like, just, just pray loud enough so that we can say amen to you as you pray over them. So that'll be the last part of this ceremony. Would you guys come on down? And then immediate family, come on up first, would you? If, you? if you don't mind, you don't have to come up. If you want to stay in your seat, you're welcome to do that. But you want to join up. And you can come around the back, up on stage if you want to. Just go wherever you can. And the rest of the church, please come up if, if you're able and would like. Yeah, if you want to, if you get in there's room to come around up on the stage. Oh, there goes a thousand dollars. All right, let's let's pray. You feel free to again pray as you want out loud, and then uh, at the end I'll close us and dismiss us.
unity in marriages, that they might that they might model teamwork and selfless love, and that they might learn from the strengths of each other, so that their children can see a healthy marriage worked out. I pray for wisdom and discernment for them as parents, and it, as it becomes increasingly more challenging as we live in a post-Christian world and post-post-Christian world, may they help teach a radical new way of thinking and of living as opposed to what they see around them. I pray for us as a church that, that we don't take this stuff lightly, that we not be afraid to have real conversations with these parents and to, to really ask how they're doing and to remember what it's like to be at these stages if we're past them and to step up and step in and to give aid of encouragement, of tangible aid, whatever it might be, to offer a, a babysitting night so they can go have uh, uh, some rest and refreshment. Lord, we just, whatever they need more, Lord, may we be there for them and with them, walk alongside of them. And God, we just say thank you and we trust you for these kids. We trust you for their future. We trust these families to you. We know that you're walking with them and that you're doing an amazing work in their lives and through their lives. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, I said we were dismissing at that point. I lied. We do have a closing worship song if you guys would like to sing that together. Um, yeah. I know you just sat down, but I'm going to ask you to stand back up again. <laughs> uh, so this last song that we're closing with is called Blessed Assurance. Uh, it's a hymn that I really love because it talks about testimony. And a big part of this uh, child dedication is us sharing our testimony to those children of what God has done in our lives and just his faithfulness. Um, so as we sing this this morning, remember that each of you have a unique story to tell to each of the children of how God has shown his love to you. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission.
is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. kids will have a good story to tell and you're going to be a part of that story may the lord bless you and keep you may his face shine upon you be gracious and give you peace and may your kids have a good afternoon today and eat lots of sweets because they went through child dedication <laughs> go peace amen amen <laughs>